start. Ah. Right. But there is a question of one student. I don't know if you want to do at the, be the beginning or later on. Yeah, I can do at the beginning. Okay, then you we give me the question now. Yes, yes, the oh, question. No. That... But I, and I, I tell you the question, but I will translate later into for the Spanish. Yeah, yeah. The question is about one man that he says, "Is a, is just enough with accumulation of merits?" That's all. What? Yeah, What's the uh, he said. He said that the literally he said, I don't know. It was in relation with something you said, but he said. Merits are uh, a necessary condition, but is it enough with just accumulation of merits? I mean, I can ask him uh, in relation to what he's asking the question. It's in relation to generating the mind of bodhicitta. Right. ¿Tú, tú has yeah. leído la pregunta, Steve? No, porque la tiene Paloma por ahí. Yeah. Oh, I think I've got it. Yeah. I think it's, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, I can I ask a question. So yes. uh, you uh, in in Valencia you don't have uh, people in the gompa at all. You don't no, have no, 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 Just Karen no, no. and I. Uh, well, Is now, that... but in during the week we have some teachings on the gompa. Not many people, oh, but uh, yes. But uh, oh, okay. this weekend, no. Mm. No. Okay. <laughs> right. Are, are they still having retreats at Urseling? Yeah, solitary retreats. Solitary. Oh, no, no, group, group retreats. No, yes. no group retreats at the moment. Time to time, in, in summer they did a little bit, but maybe one, but uh, now there is no. Because of COVID. We're in the middle of the Omicron. Yes, wave. yes, because of COVID. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so are we here, but not 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 like you are. Uh, well, but it's starting to get quite bad here as well. Oh, it has got quite Ale. bad. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Vale. Yeah, okay. Yes, uh, here. They're all arriving. Sorry, a ver. Um, <laughs> just t just tell me when to start. I think you can start now. Yeah. Okay. okay. Start. Right. Uh, uh, most m most people have gone home. They've disappeared. <laughs> no. Click on your view gallery. View. You'll see them all. Gallery again. I have to do it again. Oh, okay. Oh no! What have I done? <laughs> Can you see them all? Oh, everything's okay. disappeared. No, no, don't pro no, no oh. problem. A ver, eh, eh, don't panic. <laughs> A ver. <laughs> Everything disappears. You just yes. Steve, explícale yeah, cómo right. ir a la a la parte de arriba. Yeah, top right corner view. It's got a little icon with little squares on it. So no, no, all of that's gone. Everything has disappeared. Oh. What can you see? Oh, I, it's, it's just a message saying ditch the forty minute limit. Experience the advanced. It's an oh. advert for Zoom. Yeah, I think ah. you've come out, out of Zoom. Down the bottom, can you see? Um, like another window, which is not, oh, how can I say? There's a blue circle. Yeah. Uh, uh, Steve, oh, maybe, no, 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 uh, no. Don't, don't worry, don't worry, don't panic. Uh, Steve, si quieres consulto con Paloma, pero quizás, maybe it's okay uh, uh, to, uh, go out from soon and come you back. I Maybe, I'm not sure. On your desktop at the bottom, the toolbar. Es que puede que esté arriba, click Steve. The, um, click on the zoom icon, like a blue square with a white camera icon in the middle. No, yeah. that's not here. Not here. I think, I think, uh, Steve, I think the look, best is you go out and come back. And maybe oh, look, look, I, I'll, I'll just a talk because I can't see anybody. I so, can't um, <laughs> yeah, I'll just, I'll just start. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. No problem, no problem. Uh, okay. okay. All right. So um, we were on the first verse, um, uh, right? So th this is emphasizing the whole point of, of, of cherishing others. The, the first two verses, especially, are, you know, the whole emphasis uh, is um, about cherishing other sentient beings. 
So, um, so it says, um, I, I determined to, great the, to obtain the greatest possible benefit from all sentient beings. Um, then, uh, so that that's um, one that, that's benefit in this in terms of actually um, helping them now in in various ways, uh, mentally, physically, in every possible way. Uh, so there's that, but there's also, as I said, the idea of um, getting benefit from sentient beings in the sense of accumulating by by practicing in relation to sentient beings, one accumulates merit and one that, that one wants that merit, one is wanting that merit with a bodhicitta motivation in order to be able to, uh, one needs this accumulation uh, of merit in order to gain the realizations that bring about enlightenment. And I think there was a question from someone whether just the accumulation of merit was, was enough so in the teachings, it says to um, achieve enlightenment, you need to acu complete the two accumulations, the accumulation of merit and the accumulation of wisdom. But uh, one shouldn't take that literally that you just have the merit and that brings about enlightenment. It's you need that merit in order to gain the, all the realizations that, yeah just merit itself um yeah it w won't bring the uh, bring enlightenment you need that uh you need it to empower the mind to gain the realizations and the realizations come from meditating on such things as uh, loving kindness com developing loving kindness compassion understanding and impermanence uh, patience etc all these things one one need, it's it's developing those mental states that brings about enlightenment and one develops those by meditating on them and and but for the meditations to be successful one needs to purify the mind and accumulate have have merit all right i think that's all i can say about that uh, i hope that makes it a little bit clearer Anyway, um, going back to the first verse, so um, so it goes on to say, uh, sentient beings are more precious than a wish fulfilling jewel. So this is something that we need to try to practice, you know, develop that mind because we we tend to see, as ordinary beings we tend to see sentient beings as either friend, enemy, or stranger, a human, animal. This that well we that's about all we as human beings can ordinary human beings can see um uh, so we have this very impure view this very worldly self-centered point of self-cherishing point of view but what we can try to train the mind to see is each sentient being as more precious than a wish fulfilling jewel so a wish fulfilling jewel doesn't really relate very much to our uh, modern mind this is a, 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 you know, a Tibet, a Buddhist myth about this jewel that comes from the depths of the ocean. When you find it and treat it in a particular way, um, it, it will bring um, any worldly wish you want, right? So it's pretty wonderful. But, but the point is it can only bring worldly wishes, but it, it can't bring uh, you know, spiritual wishes. Whereas, uh, relating to sentient beings properly uh, from a Dharma point of view, um, practicing the six perfections on sentient beings that um, can bring about enlightenment. Lama Zopa Rinpoche, when he gave a com the commentary that I received on these eight verses, made the point that even if you possessed uh, a mountain of as big as Mount Meru, a mountain of diamonds and other precious jewels. Um, despite all that incredible wealth that that mountain of jewels represents, that entire mountain of jewels can't stop you from dying. It can't stop you 
falling into the lower realms. It can't buy you good health. You know, e even these basic things, good health, a long life, it can't stop you dying. Yeah. No matter how rich you are. Where, whereas, eat and by relying, by practicing in relation to not, all, not even all sentient beings, but just even any sentient being, one can create the causes to achieve the deathless state of enlightenment, free of all suffering, where one experiences peerless, everlasting happiness. So in, in reality, there is no, no, there's no comparison between the preciousness of any sentient being compared to a mountain as high as Mount Everest of, of jewels. Yeah. I, I mean, a jet, but old Jeff Bezos or whatever his name is, has, has got, what is it, $200 billion or something like that. But that none of that is going to stop him dying, growing old, getting sick, and so on. None of it. Yeah. Uh, but as I said, as Rumsha says, by relating to not just even not a combination of all sentient beings, but just practicing properly with any sentient being one can accumulate so much merit, so much merit. That is the basis for liberation and enlightenment. Um, years ago, I've probably, some of you have probably heard this story before, but many years ago when I uh, was Lama Sopa Rinpoche's attendant and lived at Dharamsala with Rinpoche, Rinpoche's house, if you know, there uh, is, there's a di uh, about a um, hundred meters perhaps, between that and the, the kitchen where Rinpoche's food is, and there's a bitumen path between them. One day I was standing on that path, talking to a friend, and Lama Sopa Rinpoche came up to us and started talking to us. And as Rinpoche was talking, he looked down and there was this tiny uh, worm uh, crossing the path, you know, and it was like, you know, it lays this, this kind of slime underneath it, which it slides along very, very slowly from one side of the, the path to the other. And sort of Rinpoche gave myself and this other person this long uh, teaching about, I, I can't remember how long it lasted. I, and I'm, I'm very sorry to say, I don't remember the details, but it was wonderful at the time pointing out how by practicing the six perfections with this slug, one could achieve enlightenment. Yeah. One can't do that with a mountain of jewels. Yeah. So it quite, quite uh, realistically, not just being some kind of uh, airy fairy, nice analogy, but in quite in reality, every sentient being is more precious than a wish fulfilling jewel, than a mountain of jewels. Yeah. This is what we need to understand. And not just nice sentient beings, not just our family, not, fret, not just our friends and good people or strangers, but even the terrible sentient beings. At another teaching, Rinpoche made the point that especially practicing the six perfections on the enemy purifies so much negative karma, accumulates so much merit. Yeah. So we're very lucky to have the enemy. So there's not one sentient being or even a group of sentient beings that we can eliminate saying these, these, these sentient beings aren't precious. Actually, all of them, and not just the the totality of sentient beings together, but even each, each and every sentient being is precious. Yeah, something because, yeah, we, we, we ourselves can benefit so much by benefiting them. 
So that's why we need to hold them most dear at all times, at all times. When, when they're being friend, when they're being stranger, when they're being enemy, when they are human, when they're animal, whatever they are, wherever they are, what we need to try to do is train to hold them most dear. In, in other translations, it says to cherish them at all times. This wonderful word, cherish, um, which um, is... You know, there are things that we talk, you know, people and and objects that we say that we, we love them. But even though we may love some people and love certain objects and whatever, I don't think we necessarily always cherish them because somehow I think the word cherish implies something more than loving and caring for them it's kind of this incredible um this mind of cherishing is the mind that you know has this absolute um appreciation this total appreciation uh for the the person or object to cherish something you, you see how, how precious, how wonderful it is. You can love something, but you don't necessarily think it is super, super wonderful. But when one, when one cherishes, somehow the mind is so totally enraptured and uh, by by the person or object, captivated, enthralled, I can't think of the word, but fully appreciative. Because I think this is what is the difference between the mind of someone who is on the path, to, who, who is fixed on following the path to just to achieving liberation from samsara in order to experience the bliss of nirvana, I think the difference between that mindset and the mindset of someone who is generally, genuinely on the Mahayana path is that, that the, the person on the path to, of individual liberation, they develop love and compassion for sentient beings, but I don't think they develop this mind that cherishes them. Yeah? Whereas someone who you know has become a bodhisattva they that that person has developed the mind that cherishes sentient beings oh. so as i was saying earlier on um if we're honest, at, at, at our level now, we can't do that. So in some ways, it's maybe not so good to say, I will do this, I shall do it. Um, but we can, we can make heartfelt prayers, requests to the gurus, the Buddhas, may I be able to do it? May I be able to do it in the future? May I be able to do it in some way now, some, some version of that now. <clears throat> and what is really important, um, this is something I, I often mention um, in a teaching by His Holiness, who was always incredibly humble. He, might, he, he, he kept saying that I, I, I'm not a Buddha, I'm not a Bodhisattva. Uh, but he said something that I found really very uh, um, moving and inspiring. He said, but what I can say very honestly is that I have a deep, although he said, although I'm not a Bodhisattva, what I can say honestly is that I have a deep admiration 
for the Bodhisattva way of life, for Bodhicitta. And this is what at least we need to develop. We need to develop this deep admiration for wanting to practice, to be like Lungri Tampa, who could commit themselves to saying, I will do this at all times. I will, I will always cherish every sentient being as, as more precious than a wish fulfilling jewel. Yeah. Because from developing that deep admiration comes the energy to, you know, to, to practice, to do the practices that will lead to developing that mindset. So in the commentaries that have been written about, um, uh, the, um, for example, um, uh, Churden Rinpoche, there is a commentary on the eight verses by Churden Rinpoche. And in that commentary, he makes the point that if one's meditating on the eight verses, at the end of each verse, one, one should make a, a very strong heartfelt request to the Guru Buddha, visualizing the Guru on, on the crown of your head and make a really strong heartfelt request for one's mind to be free of all the obstacles to being able to do that. So in this case, all the obstacles prevent one um, seeing each sentient being as more precious, precious than a wish fulfilling jewel and holding them dear at all times. So one can think of general obstacles that exist, um, but also very specific personal obstacles that one may find to try in, in trying to do this. So you make that request, you imagine this light and nectar comes from the guru down into you, eliminating those obstacles. And then, so white light and nectar eliminating, and then golden light and nectar blessing one's mind to be able to actually hold sentient beings most dear at all times, to be able to cherish them at all times, see them as incredibly precious in, in their own right. They are unbelievable. Just their, just their mere existence is incredibly precious. You know, in, in the teachings about developing the mind of equalizing itself, oneself with others, which of course is a vital thing, a, a component of developing real love and compassion for others, is, um, is to recognize that just as oneself holds oneself, you know, oneself as precious, one's, one's life as precious, we need to recognize that each sentient being has that same experience that their own life is precious. And understanding that, we can then appreciate that just as my life is precious to me, every life is precious. So then in, uh, in verse two, it goes on to say, and again, I, I just suggest to, to, to make it more meaningful and uh, all of this for me, I, I find this helpful is to think, uh, you, know, you, you add at the beginning, uh, recognizing how harmful my self cherishing is and wanting to be free of it and recognizing how beneficial, beneficial cherishing others is and I'm wanting to be able to do that, then when in the company of others, I shall always consider myself the lowest of all and from the depths of my heart, hold others dear and supreme. Um, uh, 
right? So when I was in America once, um, one Western teacher there made the point that uh, he often um, came across um, people really upset by uh, by this verse when, when he was teaching the eight verses of mind training and people were saying oh i already have such a terrible opinion of myself and now this the dharma is telling me i should think of myself as the worst person <laughs> in the world <laughs> just reinforcing their own kind of low self-esteem but really this this verse is not saying that it's not saying that we have to think of ourselves as the worst person in the world and that everybody else is far far better than ourselves it's not really saying that again i think this is why it's helpful um, to think you know why is this verse being said it's because of thinking that my self-cherishing is terrible, is harmful for me, it's harmful for others, but it's certainly harmful for myself and I want to be free of it and I need to replace and, and the best way to be free of it is to replace it with cherishing others more than self because that, that mind benefits others and it benefits myself. And for, for that reason, when I'm in the company of others, it doesn't matter who they are, uh, I shall always, or you can say, may I be able to consider myself the lowest of all. That, in other words, just simply uh, to, to put the benefit of others first, their needs first, not because I'm the worst person, but just simply because I cherish, like the first verse was all about cherishing sentient beings, seeing each and every one of them as incredibly precious. So therefore, I, 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 want, I, I, I want them to, um, to, to benefit, to be, um, to receive uh, all, whatever good things are available to help them, they should um, be protected from suffering more than myself. Not because I deserve to suffer more or something like that, but just because I cherish these beings. Just like a, a mother um, wants her child to, to, to experience happiness no matter what, and to be free of suffering no matter what even if it involves a lot of suffering for the mother. The, uh, the mother will do that in order for her child to be happy and to be free of suffering. The mother doesn't suffer because she thinks I'm terrible. She, she suffers or is willing to suffer or willing to um, um, not experience some particular pleasure, happiness, whatever because her thought is on her precious child yeah. so when in the company of others i shall always or may i in the future be able to consider myself the lowest of all and from the depths of my heart and so this, you know, in other words, you know, with incredible sincerity, hold others dear and supreme. That's just, that's what the perfect mother, not every mother is perfect, but when a mother has unconditional love for her child, then um, the child is dear and supreme for them. The mother doesn't put herself down. She just puts other, the child up. So that's what we can try to do.
because it's all about this is the way to 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 you know undermine the self cherishing thought because when in the company of others if we're under the control of the self cherishing thought or uh, or, or you know, while we're in the company of others because of what's going on you know the self cherishing thought starts to take over then in that situation we the, the very nature of self cherishing is to say that i am so important my my concerns my needs come first and and we often get under the control of that thought whether we like to admit it or not or we're, even whether we're aware of it or not that this happens but if 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 we start to um, be able to recognize that this is what happens and if we have faith in the dharma and the law of cause and effect then we can understand that when i let myself get under the control of the self cherishing thought not only am i there's a good chance i will harm others but i i am i am definitely harming myself if not obviously now i'm definitely activating my disturbing thoughts like for, such as anger or jealousy or pride and um, which is only going to bring real harm in the future but also it's just reinforcing reinforcing my delusions my afflictions every time due to self cherishing i get angry or come under the control of afflictive desire attachment pride jealousy or whatever um i am i'm activating my the the that that particular affliction which means i'm also generating an imprint of that affliction once again in my mind and by and when those afflictions motivate negative behavior then i'm also generating negative karmic imprints so due to self cherishing we can create two kinds of harmful imprints in our consciousness we can the the obvious one is the karmic negative karmic imprint from from acting on our afflictions but there's also the other kind of imprint which is the imprint of the delusion itself which guarantees you know so i get angry now and that anger is harming me and others now but then i put the imprint of anger in my mind so that this will guarantee that anger will arise in the future if you remember in the lam rim in the middle section of the lam rim about how you know, developing renunciation of cyclic existence um we, we, that mind renouncing cyclic existence comes from recognizing uh our suffering and that our suffering comes from our afflictions and how our afflictions operate and there are the 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 various conditions that activate our afflictions but the first one is the mere fact that we already have an imprint of the affliction in our mind and what what activates that imprint are all these other external conditions such as me or not necessarily external conditions but the, these various conditions such as meeting the object meeting the object of our anger meeting the object of our desire so if the imprint wasn't there if the imprint of the affliction wasn't there even if the conditions are there anger couldn't arise jealousy couldn't arise but by following the self cherishing thought now we guarantee we we've got these imprints re reestablished in our mind
So understanding the harm of the self-cherishing thought, which can be set off by sort of being with people where you get jealous of them or feeling pride in relation to them or getting angry by them, angry with them or competitive or whatever, all sorts of disturbing thoughts arising, recognizing that and wanting to subdue it, uh, then the plan of action is to consider oneself the lowest of all and, you know, really respect others, listen to them, uh, be kind to them, patient with them, et cetera, et cetera. And as much as possible, uh, hold them dear and supreme so that one doesn't activate one's afflictions. If you're holding someone dear and supreme, you know, genuinely in your heart, you, you see them as something wonderful, worthy, uh, and so on, then you're not going to, even though they are, you know, you see them as supreme, you don't, there isn't jealousy, oh, sorry, um, pride. And so on. So it's all a method to, at the very least, try to undercut our tendency to self-cherishing and to uh, practice cherishing others and cherishing others more than self. So again, uh, if one is meditating on, on this, uh, having reflected on it, um, one can uh, make that heartfelt request to the Guru Buddha to, to be free of all obstacles to, to, to doing that uh, and imagine the purification happening and then the blessing coming from the Guru Buddha, blessing the mind to be able to actually uh, practice in this way. So you may be familiar with a, a small text that Lama Soka Rinpoche put together called The Ever-Flowing Nectar of Bodhicitta. I think that's the proper title. So in that text, um, which is um, centered around meditating on the, the eight verses of mind training, um, what one does is, um, what, what Rinpoche suggests is one does this in relation to um, combining it with meditation on uh, thousand-armed Avalokiteshvara, where you visualize Avalokiteshvara in front of you or on the crown of your head, and you reflect on each verse. And having reflected on each verse, you then uh, imagine the purification coming from uh, the guru in the form of thousand-armed Avalokiteshvara, and, um, and and the, firstly the purification and then the blessing and and at the same time you recite Om Mani Padme Hum. Yeah. So that that can be a quite powerful way of, of meditating on the eight verses. But for some people, uh, I, I personally find it a little bit complicated. Uh, difficult to reflect on the, the verse and the being purified and reciting on money bad me home as well. Some people might find it very beneficial. Um, so you could just leave it as I mentioned before, uh, just thinking of the Guru Buddha on your crown and the, the purification and blessing without the recitation of mantras. Or you could separate those things. You could recite the mantra before doing the, the purification and receiving the blessing or after that's done. But I th the whole idea, I think, as, as Rinpoche has put it together, is to um, to recite Om Mani Padme Hum because this, of course, is about awakening that potential for compassion within oneself. And, of course, uh, the more compassion we have for others, 
the more we will cherish them, the more we will uh, we will have that energy to that compassionate energy to oppose our negative tendency towards self cherishing. We will have some energy to that compassionate energy that is more inclined to cherish others and cherish them more than self. So I, I think it's just a matter of um, you know experimenting with that that practice yourself. See how it, it works for you or how you can make it work for yourself in a meaningful way. <clears throat> so then the third verse uh, is, is really incredibly important. Uh, this, uh, this is one of the, this is one of the absolutely essential practices for all uh, Dharma people, whether they are following the, the path, uh, you're wanting to follow the individual vehicle path to achieving a li liberation for the sake of experiencing nirvana, or one wants to follow, you know, follow the Mahayana tradition uh, and to be able to uh, follow the Mahayana path, follow the Bodhisattva way of life. Um, either way, um, th this verse is is relevant for for all practitioners, but especially for if we if we're wanting to follow the the, the Mahayana tradition, so that we can enter the Mahayana path. So from that point of view, again, we can think, you know, recognizing my own self cherishing and how harmful it is and how it's kept me trapped in cyclic existence during beginningless time. And if I don't eliminate it, I, it will keep me trapped in cyclic existence forever. Understanding that and understanding how beneficial cherishing others is and wanting to be able to do that, then because of those, those two things, um, I will be vigilant. And the moment a delusion appears in my mind, endangering myself and others, I shall confront and avert it without delay. So this is all about, of course, the practice of mindfulness, that we need to be really mindful of um, what is going on in our mind, whether our mind is in a positive state, a virtuous state, a neutral state, whether, and especially in, in this context, um, um, when a delusion or an affliction appears in my mind, it's basically, it, it, it means that we've, we've become under the control of the self-cherishing thought. And all of the delusions, all of the afflictions uh, can, can uh, lead us to be, uh, harm others, either directly or indirectly, and they most definitely directly harm ourselves. The, uh, the, the harm from the affliction may not be obvious in this life, especially if we are under the control, you know, strongly under the control of the self-cherishing thought. Um, you know, when we're under the control of attachment, that may not appear to our worldly mind to be you know, bringing any harm, but it, uh, it will definitely, the effect of that, the imprint from that is definitely going to bring great harm in the future. So there are two reasons from the, the Mahayana point of view to be really vigilant, to be really, really mindful of the, uh, of the, the to check whether the self-cherishing thought is arising, whether the particular disturbing thoughts are arising, because um, on the one hand, uh, 
these um, these these thought these afflictions and the thoughts uh, and behavior that uh, come as a result of them are are, are are harming sentient beings. It's the very thing that if we're you know, trying to follow the Bodhisattva way of life, we want to avoid. The whole idea is to benefit sentient beings in every conceivable way, not to cause them harm. As His Holiness often says, you know, at, if one can't benefit sentient beings, at, if we're not at the point where we're able to be of any real benefit sentient beings, at least, at least, we should use this life not to harm sentient beings. Yeah. So to do that, we have to be you know, really mindful. We have to practice this mindfulness of, of, of being able to um, know whether our mind is in a virtuous state or a non-virtuous state. Be able to recognize the delusions as the afflictions as afflictions. Because the amazing thing is that, especially due to self-cherishing, our afflictions can arise in our mind. They may be extremely <laughs> obvious to other people, but not to us, not to ourselves. Our self-cherishing doesn't allow us, um, our, our, the wisdom aspect of our mind, to recognize that this is a negative state of mind. This is anger, this is jealousy, this is pride, this is uh, afflict, afflicted desire or whatever. We can, you know, our, our self-cherishing can make up all sorts of stories to you know, uh, convince ourselves that uh, this, is not, this is not a bad state of mind. This is a completely appropriate state of mind. There's nothing wrong with for me, especially me, to be in this state of mind. So, whereas mindfulness is that um, Buddhist mindfulness, you know, the real meaning of mindfulness is that awareness that knows whether the mind is in a virtuous or non-virtuous state, whether it's meaningful or meaningless, skillful or unskillful. So what, what is really crucial here, and you know, it's go, it goes on to say, um, oh, anyway, maybe I should, can, I was making this point that there are two aspects of this. So one is that it's, it, it's, it's definitely directly our harmful afflictions and, and the actions that come from them can uh, endanger others, but they um, the very thing we don't want to do, but also they endanger ourselves in various ways that they, they, they can bring harm in this life. But also by following our afflictions, being under the control of the self-cherishing thought, as I've said <laughs> many times, we, we put all these negative imprints and negative instincts in our mind. We reinforce our delusions to be experienced in future lives. So in future lives, um, we've reinforced our tendency to get angry, jealous, proud, desirous, and so on. To be, in, in other words, to be more under the control of the self-cherishing thought. And the negative imprints are creating obstacles to being able to practice the Dharma, to practice, being able to practice the Bodhisattva way of life. So it's a complete disaster. So if we want to give up the self-cherishing thought and awaken this potential to cherish others, then um, it's really vital that we develop this ability to be mindful, to be aware of what is going on in our mind, but 
mindfulness is not just awareness, right? Awareness is um, a, 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 like a, a neutral state of mind. Aware, mindfulness is a Buddhist mindfulness. Uh, and of course, uh, anyway, Buddhist mindfulness is talking about a, a, a virtuous mind. It, it's, a, it's an awareness that knows it is this virtuous mind that is concerned about recognizing whether the mind is in a good state or a bad state, virtuous or non-virtuous state. Yeah. And you know, mindfulness has that connotation of remembering. So to be mindful, you have to remember what what uh, what is virtuous, what is non-virtuous, and to be strongly mindful, you need to remember how harmful the non-virtuous states are, how beneficial the virtuous states are for oneself and others now and in the future. So basic mindfulness is a, you know, is a key element to all, every level of, of the spiritual path, whether one is just seeking um, a, a good rebirth, whether one is, one's main aim is just simply to be free of cyclic existence, and, but especially if one is trying to um, take to heart the Mahayana teachings, then one, you know, the key element is gaining some mastery of the mind, of being able to subdue, not repress, but subdue the disturbing thoughts, to give that space for our positive mental qualities, which are the true aspect of our mind to manifest which is and, and it's that true aspect of our mind that can cherish others more than self it is this false aspect of our mind which cherish you know experiences self-cherishing so what is what is really um key in the point in this verse also is where it says, um, you know, realizing how uh, the delusions uh, endanger myself and others, I shall confront and avert it without delay. So the first thing, the key thing is that, well, maybe two key things is um, that one has to confront the affliction. In other words, we have to be a willing, courageous enough, wise enough, courageous enough um, to admit this is an affliction. Yeah? This is a disturbing thought, or this is self-cherishing. We have to confront it, not let it go or pretend it's something else or pretend it's not that bad. Yeah, it's, well, maybe I'm a little bit angry, but I'm not that angry, and I'm not, you know, I'm not as angry as other people get. And anyway, I'm kind of justified to be angry in this situation. We we you know, we have to you know we have to confront the the affliction, admit what it is, and how that it it is harmful. Yeah, we have to confront it, face up to it. And we have to, and we have to face up to it uh, the moment it appears. You know, or in other words, the sooner it appears, the better. Because if we leave it too long, uh, then the affliction just gets so strong it takes over the mind. We, you know, what happens when uh, um, disturbing thoughts arise? Then we identify with those thoughts. We, you know, 
before anger arises, we, we might be in a peaceful state. So there is a peace I, there is a peaceful I. I am at peace. There's a happy, peaceful I. But as soon as anger arises in the mind, that peaceful I doesn't exist anymore. Now there's an angry I. We have completely identified with that anger. Yeah. And once we do that, it's, it's so much more difficult to be able to let go of it. But if, if we can identify the affliction as, the, as an affliction, very you know as soon as it arises then it's much e and and we remember how harmful the affliction is because we've practiced you know, practiced the lung we've, we've meditated on the disturbing thoughts of how harmful they are then um so and we remember all that then it, it becomes we it's easier to let go of it so, for example, in meditation, when one is meditating an object and if one is, has good mindfulness and you, if one is able to detect the distraction or the hindrance straight away or very quickly, one, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to just let go of it straight away. You don't have to apply the antidote. One can just... Oh, this is a you know, this is an affliction. This is a dis this is this is anger. This is jealousy, or this is an unnecessary thought. You just label it like that, and it it can be dealt with. But the longer it lasts in the mind, then it gets stronger and stronger. It, it, it takes over the whole mind. We become oneness with it. And of course, there are the. Um, antidotes to the, all of the different afflictions but it takes a lot of time and energy to uh, you know, learn how the antidotes and how to apply them so so important to be able to try to catch the afflictions which come from the manifestations of the self-cherishing thought as quickly as possible so, so there's those two things. We have to try and do it quickly. We have to confront it, uh, recognize it, admit it. Don't you know? Pretend, uh, you know, about what's going on. We have to be really honest with ourselves and confront it, admit it, face it, and face it as quickly as possible. And then we have to avert it, yeah, without delay, yeah without delay so the, um, so that means as i said you know it, it, like if one if in meditation just by labeling something as or oh, this is thought or this is anger or this is that ju just that if we catch it quickly can be enough if it's not if 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 the affliction the dis the hindrance in the mind has got stronger then we need to try to apply the appropriate antidote. So there are specific antidote. This is a whole huge topic, which I'm not going to go into other than say, there are specific antidotes for every affliction. And we need to learn those meditate on them. Because yeah, to in order to apply them, we have to have trained our mind in developing the understanding of the, the antidote. And, you, uh, and then uh, when, when one is not under the control of it, and then when, when the actual, uh, when we're not under the control of the affliction, and, and, and in the situation when the affliction itself actually is present, then we have to apply that, what we've learned, that antidote. But that really does take time and effort, great effort. But that's what we need to do. That's what the yeah, so much of the path. You know, one definition of what is Dharma practice is is um, 
anything that um, that uh, that opposes our disturbing thoughts. So we have to try and do that. And of course, the more we train in meditation to be mindful and also practice introspection as where you introspection is that that mental factor that in combination with mindfulness uh, acts to uh, deal with any hindrance, any affliction and so on. So the more we learn to do that in meditation, out of meditation in our daily life, which of course is most of our time, but the more we've trained our mind in, in working with our mind in meditation, the more we will have some ability to be more mindful in daily life and to be able to catch the disturbing thoughts, the self-cherishing, countless manifestations, to, to confront them and avert them. So again, if we're meditating on these eight verses, um, or even if one's just, if you're wanting to memorize them, then as I, I, I suggest, it's good to, you know, um, add the, the point at the beginning, you know, because sometimes we can lose sight of what, what, what is the purpose of these verses. These are, these are very difficult things to do. Why, why, why am I doing them? Why am I doing them? Is to overcome the self-cherishing thought and to be able to begin to cherish others. That's why we're doing it. And um, so uh, whether one's meditating on it or just maybe uh, reciting it out loud or whatever, uh, at the end of that verse, each verse, again, um, Think of the Guru Buddha on one's crown and making a heartfelt request to be free of the obstacles to being mindful and, and being able to avert and uh, confront and avert without delay the disturbing thoughts. So imagine um, the mind being purified of the obstacles that prevent one being able to be mindful and so on. And then golden light and nectar coming from the Guru Buddha, blessing the mind to be actually able to do this practice of mindfulness, of confronting and averting immediately the disturbing thoughts so that one can re really get oneself cherishing under control and give the mind freedom for that ability to cherish others. Uh, so before going on, uh, I'd just like to read something. Uh, I hope I, I can't see anyone or hear anything. You're still hearing <laughs> so me. Oh, that's good. You're not alone. I, have, have you... <laughs> I thought you might have all fallen asleep or gone to I bed or something. Like your, your browser window, you know, your internet window that you're looking at. I think Zoom's open, obviously, because it's working, but it's behind it. If you go to the top right corner of the window and click on this, the little icon to minimize it, you should see us. So we're kind of, I think, behind it. Uh, uh, no, Don't no. click on the cross, which is to close. Oh, no, I've lost it. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, my. No, that's back to that. Oh, really? I don't, don't worry. Know. Don't worry. <laughs> No, okay. <laughs> anyway. Ah, mira, el libro de su santidad. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, okay, anyway, I just want to read something from His Holiness the Dalai Lama, which comes from a commentary on the eight verses of mind training. 
Um, you may be familiar with this little book. It's quite old. I don't know if you've seen this. It's, this is one in English. Yes, yes, we have in Spanish. Uh, we have in right. Spanish that book, oh, but right. I don't have here now, but it's okay. Right. It's okay. Okay. So it, he says, um, at some point, the question comes up, can we really change our attitude? Yeah. In other words, it, you know, giving up self-cherishing sounds really hard. Can we really change this? Can we really begin to cherish others and cherish them more than self? And his oldest goes on to say, my answer on the basis of my little experience is, without hesitation, yes. <laughs> this is quite clear to me. The thing that we call mind is quite peculiar. Sometimes it is very stubborn and very difficult to change. But with continuous effort and with conviction based on reason, our minds are sometimes quite honest. When we really feel that there is some need to change, then our minds can change. Wishing and praying alone will not transform your mind, but with conviction and reason, reason based ultimately on your own experience, you can transform your mind. Time is quite an important factor here, and with time, our mental attitudes can certainly change. Which is also about this whole point of the power of familiarity. If we f allow our mind to be familiar with something, then what starts off as very difficult because we're not familiar with it, but the more we become familiar, it becomes easier and easier. So this works with both good and bad things. If we allow ourselves to be familiar with what is negative, then we become, it becomes very easy to be negative. And unfortunately, since beginningless time, we've allowed ourselves to be familiar with the self-cherishing thought. So it comes very easy. But we now have the precious human rebirth, which is, gives us the optimum chance to become familiar with cherishing others more than self, and also to become familiar with how harmful, what, to become familiar with what self-cherishing is and how harmful it is. So you know, just to link what His Holiness said, with what I was trying to say, he says, um, when we really feel that there is some need to change, our minds can change. So if we allow ourselves through the power of familiarity to become familiar with our self-cherishing and how harmful it is, inescapably, that we are not going to escape the harm of our own self-cherishing, then the need to change will arise. And then, as His Holiness says, when we really feel that there is some need to change, our minds can change. Okay. Any questions? Have we got any questions yet? Anything? Yes, there is one question. One moment I read. A ver. Yeah. Uh, Steve, eh, ¿quieres traducir tú la, la pregunta? La pregunta dice, 
eh, si una aflicción se expresa mediante el ego, ¿cómo se expresa un pensamiento virtuoso? ¿Se lo quieres traducir a, a Steve, por favor? Digo a Neil. If a delusion is expressed through the ego, um, how do you express positive actions, or positive thoughts? What's that through? What? What? No, I'm lost. Please, again. <laughs> Say it again in Spanish. Vale, en español dice, eh, gracias por las enseñanzas, y luego dice, si una aflicción se expresa mediante el ego, ¿cómo se expresa un pensamiento virtuoso? Yeah, so if a negative thought is, if, um, if it is the, I'm going to put it the other way around, might be better in, in English. If a negative thought arises from the ego, where do positive thoughts arise, arise from? Uh, good question. Um, uh, um, I, I think, um, I think maybe there's a little bit of a misunderstanding there. Um, Because it sounds, it sounds like you know we've got a real ego that generates neg that real ego uh, generates negative thoughts. It's not like that, but because the mind is holding to the wrong view that there is this uh, inherently existing I, the the disturbing thoughts exist because of that precondition. But um, The, the, virtu you know, the virtuous thoughts are all, are all a reflection of the true nature of our mind. So, yeah. So that true nature of mind is always there. It's obscured, but it's not absolutely 100% obscured. I, I, yeah. The... the, the, the Yeah. So it's like the sky. Uh, I mean, today I was uh, sitting outside and at one point the, the sky, there was just pure blue sky. And, and, um, and then some little white clouds started to appear. And, and of course, some, some days there's just gray clouds everywhere. You can't see the blue sky, but the blue sky is always there. So the, 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 pure, the pure mind is always there, but it's much of the time it's obscured a great deal. But uh, when there's a gap in the clouds, then the, these, these good thoughts can pop out. Uh, is that making any sense? Does that, is, any, is that any good, um, Steve? Yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Nice example, thanks. Um, I mean, yeah. Yeah, you know, when when the, that the sense of the when we're not holding on to the sense of you know the sense of I is always there, but we're not grasping onto it heavily all the time. So when that that's not happening, there's a chance for the, the these virtuous, you know, wise, compassionate thoughts, feelings to manifest because that is the mind. You know, the true mind. You know, all, all of our disturbing thoughts are they are consciousness but they are not a true aspect of the mind they uh, that, that's why they can be if, if they were they could never be removed the mind itself is actually you know when ignorance is removed uh, uh, and, and the, uh, when all obscurations are removed from the mind Um, and the mind, the mind is able to do the thing it, it, it and only the mind can do, which is to know, then the mind will know things exactly correctly as they are. So the mind will only know with love and compassion and wisdom. Because knowing with anger and, and attachment, these are, these are invalid ways of knowing they are not it, true knowledge they're not true knowing they're false distorted ways when you get rid of all of that 
all there is, the mind is only, you could say, it's a cake made up of the ingredients of love, compassion, and wisdom, and all good things. And those and that energy that which is the mind, um, you know, the, the positive thoughts we have now are a feeble expression of that pure mind that they've escaped like through the fog of obscurations. Did that make sense? Yeah, I think you've cleared the fog away a little bit. <laughs> There's some great <laughs> sun coming through. <laughs> There's another question here, Neil. Oh, okay. Um, this question goes, could you please explain the concept again a bit about the need to not repress um, negative thoughts, but to subdue them? Right, yeah. Or maybe not identify with them, but to eliminate Yes, that yeah. Yeah, you know, this is incredibly important that you know, we, we all have disturbing thoughts because we, we, we all have ignorance and therefore on the basis of that all the, distur the disturbing thoughts arise or we, we have the potential for them. So um, just repressing them doesn't, doesn't help. It actually because the, the energy is still there. It's not going away. It's just being squashed. And, and uh, according to you know, modern psychology, it just manifests in all sorts of you know, neuroses and psychoses and things like that it's eventually. So it's, it's not uh, beneficial. And um, what we have to do is we have to deal wisely and compassionately with our afflictions and so we uh, so we have to recognize that it's there we you know and like i was saying before uh, not pretend you know my experience is that um i, I did this uh, I, uh, I think a lot of buddhists do it once you become a buddhist and you become aware of your own delusions and you know that you know the delusions are bad you, one wants to once one there's a tendency to think oh, I'm a Buddhist, I, I'm not supposed to have delusions or bad delusions. And so there's a tendency to kind of pretend they're not there or they're not as bad as they are. But we have to recognize in order to deal with them properly, we have to recognize them, not repress them. And, you know, sometimes it's good enough just to simply, uh, and one has the skill simply not to identify with it, you know, just see it like a cloud floating through the mind and it's gone. One can try and you know, that practice of watching thoughts where you, you observe the thoughts, but don't get involved with them. You don't identify with them because as soon as we identify with them, we feed them and give them energy and they get power, more powerful. But if one does not identify and feed them, then they have, they're not self-sustaining. They're not getting any energy to feed them, so they fizzle out. But uh, otherwise, we have to try to uh, apply the antidotes rather than re repressing. We we have to subdue the the disturbing thought. And um, how I explain it, I don't know if this is valid. I hope so. Is that you know, for example, anger or anger or attachment or any of the afflictions, they arise. Uh, it, it, you know, there's a whole lot of things going on. The way we're thinking about ourselves, about someone else or something else, and various other factors bubbling away in our mind, and all of those those thoughts and feelings bubbling away in the mind uh, because of that arising, depending on all of that arising, you, we label that as anger, right? So, you know, anger is not an inherently existing thing. It's arising depending on many factors, yeah? So you have, 
right? So there's all that stuff bubbling away. And you can say on top of that or on the basis of that, not on top of that, but because of that, you have anger. You know, if that's not there, there's no anger. Anger doesn't exist as a separate entity. Again, it's like the cake. <laughs> you have all these ingredients and suddenly you have something that is not just all the ingredients. It's, it's a cake. It's anger. A cake, ang ang angry cake. <laughs> oh. uh, yeah. So, and it, suppressing it, is like you're squashing down, but all of this stuff is still there. You're not getting rid of it. You're just hiding it and repressing it, and it just manifests in other ways, right? So what one what what one does in subduing the delusions? What we try to do is we are applying the antidote. So the antidote is called is labeled patience. But that patience is a state of mind that arises because a whole series of virtuous, wise thoughts have, have, are, are being activated because one has been learned the, the, by studying and meditating on the Lum Rim section about patience. You understand the, all, all, all the harm of patience and of anger and so on. And you reflect on that deeply. And so that becomes imprinted in the mind. So when anger arises, um, which is a negative state, but that you, you've created this, this antidote, um, which can, with mindfulness and introspection, can be activated. Yeah. And so you've got this, on the one hand, you've got this, this negative series of energies bubbling away in the mind and these positive ones and you can't have the two existing at the same time the mind can only be in one a positive or a negative state at any moment it can't be both so the skill is that through you know th through the power of familiarity one generates this strong energy this wisdom energy of anger, of patience as the antidote to anger. So here you've got the anger, which is has only existing because of all this rubbish going on. But this good stuff comes along, gobbles that up, and the patience and the anger fizzles out. Yeah. Thanks. Very helpful. So that's what that's what subduing is about. Yeah. But normally for most, uh, most of us, especially if we haven't met the Dharma or haven't put it into practice properly, then when anger comes, we don't have anything. There's all this thought stuff going on in our mind, much of which we're not aware of, but that's what is generating anger. Uh, but we have nothing to counteract it. Or uh, all we have maybe is, oh, society tells me, Anger is bad. Oh, I shouldn't be angry. But that, that's just words and it has no power. Yeah. Anger, anger, anger is bad and it's good to remember it's bad. But what gives those words power is understanding why it's bad, why it's harmful, how harmful it is, how harmful it is to me, to others now and in the future. And not just un know, you know, intellectually knowing that, but getting some gut reaction of, of believing that. And that comes through doing Lumrim analytical meditation on developing patience or developing the opponent to attachment and so on. Yeah. So, but like I said, but I'm not trying to put people off, but we just have to accept that that takes time and energy. But that's what the, you know, our precious human rebirth is about. There are the, what is it, the three great purposes of the, the precious human rebirth. The first of which is that uh, we, we've got the optimum chance to, um, 
to accomplish any virtuous goal we want in this life. In, in the, the main one being to um, be able to create the causes to ensure we get a, another good rebirth, especially another precious human rebirth or rebirth in the pure land. But also um, that great purpose it covers um, being able to accomplish any virtuous goal, such as learning how to practice patience. We have, we have the optimum chance to do it, we, or you know, to learn the opponents to all the disturbing thoughts. Because the, we, we've met the Dharma that explains it all. We've got teachers who can help us explain, you know, elucidate the teachings. We've got, we've got some time to med meditate. The only problem is we, we, um, is our own spiritual laziness that we don't do it. We don't recognize how, you know, oh, I can do that. But it's our spiritual laziness. And where does our spiritual laziness come from? If you don't answer this correctly, you're all fired. The self-cherishing thought. Yes, the self-cherishing thought. The self-cherishing thought. Why haven't we realized, got the realization of the precious human rebirth because of the self-cherishing thought? On that happy note, I think we have to finish. It's almost time to finish. Well, yeah. Is that you. okay? Brilliant. Yeah, you really answered that question and a lot more, I think. Um, so yeah, we, we finish now with with your teachings until tomorrow, same time. This afternoon, yeah. people have got a revision class with uh, Venerable Paloma. Right, right. So we can, yeah, just do a quick dedication prayer, if you like. Yes. We've got so, a, um, five minutes, eh? Just checking the time. Oh, is, or is there another question, that, a quick question I could answer, I mean, other than really starting question. another verse? It's a bit... There is, no, there is no more questions now. Oh, okay, okay. Um, anyway, maybe this is enough for tonight or this morning, right? <laughs> yeah, this morning for us. Yeah, okay, uh, right. So we can dedicate. So um, please um, dedicate the... Uh, where are we? Oh, just a minute. Um, uh, dedicate the merit um, that um, that due to this merit may we be able to be able to um, use this precious human rebirth to overcome the self cherishing thought and develop the mind that is able to cherish others more than self and as a result of that may we be able to quickly achieve enlightenment in in order to enlighten all kinds suffering mother sentient beings. Go on, dear, your daughter, Lama Sange, drop your name, draw a chigyam maluba, te salagapa Janjo semjo rimbo che Makye panang ge gyo chik Kye panyam ba me pa yang Kone gondu pelm ba shong And uh, we could also finish with the, um, the long life prayers um i'm not sure do you do the the oh i don't have we've got his holiness the long life dalai lama prayer on the screen at the moment Gunri oh you, you use that one okay gangri rawe korwe shingam dear Pendan de wa malu chowe ne chen re zi wan ten zin gyan zo yi 
Shambhe Sitte Bardo Tengyo Chi. And for Lama Sokha Rinpoche. To so shanjim jangan gawe ten zingye pelwe kumzo toborze cho sungur wele manto dro pada zoduje Gandu Shantanjo. You're you're back. Yay. I can see your, all your nice faces. Yay. Hi. Now now we are back. <laughs> <laughs>